Labor Committee, we are uh, back in order. And um, it, I'm very pleased that we are going to be able to hear Senate File 1988 this evening. Um, and welcome also to our many guests who've joined the, the Senate Labor Committee as well. Senator Seberger, if you'd join us up at the testifier's table. And welcome, Mr. Dunnick. And our other testifier. And uh, what we'll go ahead and do is I'll just hand it over to you, Senator Seberger, for the presentation of your bill. And um, then we'll hear from the testifiers. And then we'll have some discussion with the members. All right. To your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. It is my pleasure to be here <clears throat> presenting for your consideration Senate File 1988. Um, this bill takes the work that's been done in previous legislation with regard to wage theft and takes it a little further. Um, one in five workers is likely to experience being misclassified, paid off the books, and or have their wages stolen. This bill will ensure that construction workers subjected to wage theft will have recourse to collect unpaid wages from contractors and to incentivize the hiring of responsible contractors by placing the responsibility to prevent wage theft upon those with who, who have the most control over construction labor practices. A 2021 study by the Midwest Economic Policy Institute estimates that 23% of, construct, of construction workers are misclassified. Workers are frequently paid entirely off the books by subcontractors. And this business model is set up for the purpose of profiting from the exploitation of a largely immigrant construction force. <clears throat> this exploitative business model is found on about 50% of multifamily construction projects under the drywall, wood framing, painting, roofing, and siding scopes of work. This exploitative business model is rarely found on projects covered by prevailing wage laws or on union projects because workers have recourse on those projects to ensure that they are paid properly. Similar legislation has currently passed in eight states in Washington, D.C., including California, Nevada, Illinois, Maryland, Virginia, New Jersey, New York, and Connecticut. <clears throat> Madam Chair and members of the committee, I'm particularly honored to bring this bill for your consideration. Um, for the mere fact that it protects some of our most vulnerable workers in the workforce. It protects those who are subjected to wage theft who may not know that they have recourse or where to turn for recourse. It protects those who are working and maybe have a language barrier. Um, and it, it offers protection um, to those folks who need it the most and who are most subject to wage theft. I have a number of testifiers here. Uh, when the commission is ready, I'd be happy to turn it over to them to explain a little bit more about uh, this good bill. Um, that sounds great. Thank you, Senator Seberger, for the um, introduction. And we look forward to hearing the testimony from the testifiers. And as, as you'd come up, I, ha I do have a list of, of people who have signed up to testify um, as, as well. So if you need to kick it back to me to, to say who's next, um, please do that. But in, in, uh, we can just go with, with what you have for now, Senator Seberger. All right. My first testifier is Adam Dunnick. And if you'd just introduce yourself, and this goes for all of the testifiers, if you'd introduce yourself and your title and your affiliation for the record, and we look forward to hearing your testimony in the bill. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Adam Dunnock. I'm the Director of Government Affairs for the North Central States Regional Council of Carpenters. It's a real pleasure to be here this evening. In summary, Senate File 1988 will ensure that construction workers subjected to wage theft have recourse to collect unpaid wages from contractors. General contractors and project owners will see the necessity to hire responsible subcontractors by placing the responsibility to prevent wage theft upon those with the most control over the construction labor practices. Compliance will finally be incentivized. Before I begin to talk about the specifics of the bill, I want to state unequivocally that wage theft hurts workers, it hurts law-abiding businesses, and it hurts communities. We believe that general contractors subcontract parts of their job, but they ought to remain responsible for the labor that they subcontract. Today, general contractors are responsible for safety on the project, and they can held, uh, be held accountable for that. They're also responsible for workers' compensation on their projects, and they can be accountable for that. 
And in a similar way, we're asking that wage and hour violations also should be the responsibility of general contractors. For years, we've heard from generals and other developers that this sort of misclassification has created a competitive disadvantage for honest businesses. For years, we were also asked by the AGC and other employer partners of ours what we are doing to curtail the practice of workers being paid off the books. And some may ask, why are we working on another wage theft bill? We just passed the bill in 2019. And the biggest reason is that we haven't seen much change in the industry since the law was passed. Approximately half the multifamily work we see in the wood frame, drywall, and other scopes of work are still being performed by subcontractors who pay cash under the table. In some ways, it took a high-profile case of alleged wage theft for us to consider this legislation. The workers that we assisted who worked at Viking Lakes in Egan and across other projects in the Twin Cities were owed thousands of dollars over a period of not just months, but years. The current law wasn't working for them, but it wasn't about one general contractor or one developer. Unfortunately, there are many who are breaking the rules and benefiting from the status quo. And who is losing? The workers. Imagine being an exploited worker. Imagine that for a moment. You'll, be able to ch you'll get a chance in, in, later in testimony to hear from some workers directly. But being owed large sums of money, having no ability to seek recourse from your employer. We think of this bill as leveling the playing field between the worker and not only their direct employer, but the general contractor, who has final say and ultimate control of their job site. Today, a worker has to attempt to navigate a web of subcontractors, sometimes as many as three or four or fifth tier subcontracting that's often intentionally designed to deprive workers of wages and to avoid accountability. We also believe that this bill aims the legislation at where the problem exists. We exempt a number of construction projects that include single family construction when a homeowner is having work done at their home, state prevailing wage projects, and contractors who have signed collective bargaining agreements. And there was even some testimony given about why would we exempt some of these projects. And the reason is there are other ways for, for workers to be paid. There are better investigative tools. There does exist this other uh, system of compliance in place already. We continue to meet with the AGC because it is important for us to maintain a partnership with them. However, if they are not pushing for the sort of changes that workers deserve, we'll continue to push for these changes in law that help us to deter and eliminate wage theft and tax fraud. Any, um, any amount of worker exploitation is too much and must not go unchecked. We believe that the best enforcement of wage theft and paying workers off the books is to have compliance, and the best way to, for that is to ensure that general contractors are, are liable for the workers on their site. Our goal is absolutely not to have a bunch of contractors caught breaking the law. Our goal is for general contractors to do the right thing. Hire subcontractors that have real payrolls, real employees who are on the books and not cutting corners, paying cash under the table. We're pleased to be joined by other supporters that you hear from as well, workers, a city council member, labor organizations, worker centers, and, and employers. I reference a few letters of support that, that uh, are coming from contractors as well. And uh, glad to continue to work on this issue through the session. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Dunn, for your testimony. And is this Mr. Troutman? Yes, thank you very much. Welcome to the committee. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Simon Troutman. I'm a Richfield City Council member. I'm also an attorney uh, active in the space fighting for uh, worker and labor rights and fighting wage theft and also the chair of a group called City Leaders Against Wage Theft and Tax Fraud, which is a group of more than 20 city leaders across the state on a bipartisan basis are committed to the project of ending wage theft in Minnesota. And unfortunately, uh, as, uh, as the Senator mentioned, uh, more than one in five uh, Minnesotans in the in the trades have been the victim of wage theft and tax fraud. And uh, the only thing I would add to Mr. Dunnick's list of people who are victimized is also the government that loses tax re revenue, frankly, when people steal from workers to pad their bottom line and submit un, uh, uncompetitive bids. Uh, we have a saying that there's no such thing as magic drywall. You know, drywall costs the same for everybody. And when bids are lower, there's a place that they come from. And when it's 20%, when it's 23%, it's so obvious that this is a policy problem that's deeply, deeply broken. And if we were to think about where theft impacts people's lives, it's when they've worked hard in good faith, in the hopes, in the promise that they're gonna get their wages. If you had to pick one moment where it really impacts, when theft really impacts people's lives. It's after they've traded the only thing they have in the world, they've traded their labor, and they expect to be paid. And this 
this law, this, this amendment to the wage theft uh, uh, legislation will give, uh, frankly, lawyers like myself the opportunity to fight for workers and laborers who have their wages stolen. And as, as a corporate attorney, I can tell you that the structures are real, the strategy is, is implemented, the, the loopholes are being exploited, and the people who are in the best position to be able to know what is happening on a construction site are the general contractors. And what this law is asking for is the opportunity for the people who are res generally responsible for the construction projects to be generally responsible for an epidemic of theft. And I think all of us as, as a city council member, I imagine as a senator too, you heard from all your constituents when crime began to rise. And as you think and you consider this bit of legislation, I'd like you to think what it would mean in your district if one in five homes had, had a theft. One in five homes. How many resources would we marshal? And in this circumstance, we're not asking for an unfunded mandate. We're not asking you for a new government program. We're just asking to give workers the tools to, to be paid for their wages. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony. Senator Seberger, do you have other testifiers that you would like to yeah, I, invite up? Thank you, Madam Chair. I believe Francisco Lorenzo Lozano is next. Very good. Oh. Great. And it looks like, and we have a translator also. Welcome, welcome yes. to you both to, um, to the Senate Labor Committee. If, um, as uh, before you begin your testimony, um, make sure to lean into the microphone closely when you're speaking so that we can really hear you and um, get you on the record. And if you could both introduce yourselves uh, for the record as well before you begin the testimony, that would be great. Antes que nada, buenas tardes a todos y miembros del Comité del Senado. Mi nombre es Francisco Lozano Luna. Um, before everything else, my name is Diana Solorzano. I am here on behalf of Francisco to help um, translate. Oh, trabajo en la construcción. Estoy aquí para apoyar el archivo 1988 del Senado, uh, que nos permitirá, como yo, responsabilizar a los contratistas, constructores, cuando contraten a... Um, thank you, Madam Chairwoman and Senate Committee members. I work in construction. I'm here in support of Senate File 1988. This will allow workers like me to hold contractors and developers responsible when they hire labor brokers. Si esto se convierte en ley, los contratistas no podrán aprovecharse de los trabajadores como yo. If this becomes law, contractors won't be able to take advantage of workers like me. Um, algunos, con, por las personas con las que yo he trabajado, eh, nos incitan a cosas que no nos roban los salarios, cosas. Some of the people that I worked for, um, they've stolen our wages. Um, estuve trabajando hace, un, hace aproximadamente un año para una compañía que se llama PNC en el proyecto Viking Lays. About a year ago, I was working for a company uh, named PMC at the Minnesota Vikings Lake site. Él de alguna manera u otra, no, a mí, algunos otros compañeros estuvo incitando a, diciendo cómo podríamos obtener una identificación para poder sacar alguna compañía, una LLC. Um, the labor broker, um, in one way or another, enticed us to, or alluded that there were some ways that we could get fake papers. De alguna manera otra yo comprendí que él lo trataba de hacer para, por la manera en cómo nos estaba pagando, todo el tiempo fue en efectivo. I realized that he was doing this um, because he was paying us in cash. Nunca nos pagó overtime, nunca nos pagaba realmente lo que él 
lo que él nos había dicho desde un principio que nos iba a pagar por, por horas. He never paid us overtime. He never paid us what he originally agreed that he was going to pay us. Trabajábamos de 6 a 7 días, de 13 a 14 hasta 15 horas diarias. Uh, we were worked 6 to 7 days, um, sometimes from 12 to 14 days, um, 12 to 14 hour days. Por lo que algunas personas rondaban los sueldos desde los 200 dólares, algunos 120 dólares, era un sueldo muy bajo, creo yo, para las horas que trabajábamos. And we would be paid between 120 to 200 dollars per day, which I think is very minimal for the amount of work that we were doing. Recuerdo que cuando empezamos a trabajar solo éramos tres o cuatro personas y él, en el punto que acaba yo de decir que nos incitó, nos dijo que sacáramos alguna compañía y lo, lo hizo con la intención de que se le había salido de control tantas personas que tenía y no hay, era mucho lo que él pagaba en efectivo. Um, so he started off with about three to four workers. Um, he encouraged us to get an LLC and I believe he did this because he was, he didn't realize how much money he was paying them in wages. Aunado eso, nos quería hacer un descuento de un 7% de taxes que decía porque él tenía que pagar uh, deducibles, gastos, cosa que no era así. On top of this, he also deducted about 7% off of our wages. Um, he said it was because he needed to pay insurance and other things. La, la cuestión fue que a raíz de que algunas personas no estuvimos de acuerdo en la forma como él quería hacer las cosas, fuimos, le dijimos que no estábamos a favor de cómo quería hacer eso, por qué nos descontaba. Um, me and my other coworkers, we didn't agree with what he was doing, so we went and confronted him about it and told him we didn't agree with what he was doing. ¿Por qué nos estaba descontando? Y él dijo que era para para pagar sus fondos, porque él tenía que pagar este gastos, eh, los deducibles de los impuestos y cosas así. Yo le dije, pero ¿por qué? ¿Por qué? O sea, ¿por qué hacer eso? Digo, creo que no puedes tú hacer eso. Y él dijo, no, tú… Decía que incitaba yo a los demás a que, a que le hiciéramos preguntas, ese tipo de preguntas que no le hiciéramos. Um, so I went and asked him why he was taking this out of our wages. He said um, it was because of bills that he had to pay, insurance and such. Um, and then he told me that I kept enticing the others to keep confronting him. Um, hay tantas cosas que, que se dieron en el transcurso que estuvimos trabajando ahí, yo y algunos otros compañeros, tantas injusticias que miramos con respecto a la compañía PNC, donde... Eh, era abuso laboral, era abuso más que nada pues monetario porque no 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 teníamos nunca lo que nos lo que nos decía. Um, there was a lot of injustices that occurred while I worked at um, PMC, a lot of uh, labor abuse, a lot of financial abuse because ultimately he also wasn't paying us what he said he was. Pues en sí eso es lo que yo puedo decir del tiempo que estuve trabajando ahí, algunas cosas más. Por el momento ahora me siento un poco nervioso, esto es algo nuevo para mí. Um, eh, hay tal vez más personas que pudieran hablar, pero creo que por el momento no. So, yeah, this is all the type of things that happened to me while I was on that job site. I'm a little nervous because this is the first time I'm doing something like this. Um, but this is what I can say about my story. De, de acuerdo a, a todo esto, por lo poco que he escuchado, creo yo que todos los trabajadores, quienes en este caso, mis compañeros, seríamos muy, nos llenaremos de enorme gusto al saber que ustedes pudieran apoyar en este tipo de cosas, porque no todas las voces pueden, en este caso, llegar aquí a, a decir esto que yo estoy diciendo. Um, I can speak for me and my coworkers. We would be incredibly grateful if you guys could support a bill like this because there's a lot of voices out there that can't speak up. Hay tantas, tantas, así como yo, hay tantas voces que pudieran 
hablar, decir, no tenemos la oportunidad como la que hoy me están dando y tal vez intimidados por personas como, como este tipo de compañías que se dedican a todo este tipo de robos y no aunado con eso, sino que somos intimidados, somos amedrentados y muchas personas no queremos hablar por temor a personas como dueños de estas compañías. There's a lot of people out there who um, are just too afraid to speak because we feel intimidated by companies like PMC. Um, and I just know that there's a lot of us out there who are going through this. Muchos de los contratistas honestos ya toman estos pasos. Esto podría asegurar que no haya más excusas y que no haya más trabajadores explotados como yo. This will would ensure that there is no more excuses and that there is no more um, workers exploited like me. Y por mí eso es todo, señora Presidenta y Senadores. Gracias por su tiempo y por dedicarme este este pequeño espacio. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman and Senators. Um, thank you for your time and allowing me to speak to you today. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Madam Chair, next is Octavio, Octavia Chung. Welcome to the Senate Labor Committee. If you'd uh, introduce yourself for the record, and uh, we look forward to hearing your testimony. Uh, Madam Chair and committee members, for the record, my name is Octavio Chong Bustamante. I'm an organizer for the Labor's Union, La Yuna. I'm originally from Panama. My wife is from Minnesota, and we live in Hugo. When I came here, I had to rebuild my entire life. Other than my wife, I didn't know, I didn't know anyone, and I could not speak English well. Like many Latino immigrants, I found work in the construction industry. I was lucky, my employer paid family supporting wages and provided union health, retirement, and training benefits. Equally important, they paid their taxes, unemployment, and workers' uh, compensation premiums. If I was laid off because work was slow, I had unemployment insurance to get me, to get me and my family through. If I or one of my coworkers got hurt on that job, we receive uh, proper medical care. Sadly, many workers are not so lucky. Part of my job as an organizer with La Yuna is to prevent irresponsible contractors from getting ahead by cheating workers and taxpayers and undercutting law obedient com competitors by breaking the law through tax and insurance fraud. Here is an example. Last year, I assisted a worker named Marco who had recently broken his ankle after filing of a letter on a construction project. The general contractor of the project was a subsidiary of a multi-billion dollar building supply company. When Marco was injured, his direct boss, a so-called independent contractor, con contractor, should have arranged medical treatment for him and help him file a worker's compensation claim. Instead, Marco and a co-worker explained to me that their boss trying to persuade Marco to lie to authorities and seek medical care under the boss's name at taxpayer expense. Marco said that when he refused to participate in the shim, the boss responded by firing him and his co-worker and by training him to report them to, to the police and immigration enforcement. Marco's injury prevented him from working in construction and he faced thousands of dollars in medical debts while the lawyers argue over who should pay the bills. This is not how the system is supposed to work, but I can tell, tell you, based on my experience, stories like Marco's are far too common. The nightmare that workers like Marco face on a daily basis won't end until we, should, we start holding general contractors responsible for abuses that happen on their watch. Under current law, general contractors, like the one that hired Marco's boss, don't face any real consequences of using subcontractors that exploit workers and cheat taxpayers. We have shared evidence of wage theft and other abuses with general contractors on many occasions, but our employees have largely been ignored because they clearly don't see, those, don't see it as their problem. Senate File 1988 will level the playing field for responsible contractors and ensure contractors that enrich themselves at the expense of workers and taxpayers 
taxpayers are held accountable. I ask you all to support this proposal. Thank you, Senator Seberger, for introducing a bill that will better serve and protect construction workers who often just don't know the right or where to turn for help. And finally, Madam Chair, I want to remind, remind members of the committee that these issues affect real people. The workers that are building our remarkable communities in every corner of, of, of this state, of the state of Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. <laughs> Madam Chair, next we have Roberto Jacobo. Welcome to the Senate Labor Committee. Yes. Hi, how are you today? Very well, thank you. Thank you to, to be here. I'm going to start in, in Spanish. He's going to be my interpreter, so. Very good. Thank you very much, both of you, um, and thank you for translating. Um, if you would both introduce yourselves for the record, your own names for the record, including uh, our translator here today, and then uh, we look forward to um, hearing your testimony. And um, before we start, I, I am just going to say I appreciate so much all of the support and enthusiasm from all of the people here, and I appreciate um, deeply the desire to want to clap for everyone. I, I'm just going to respectfully ask, because we do have testifiers um, who are both in support of the bill and um, some that are not in support of the bill, so I just want us to, as, as much as you can, sort of restrain your um, outward expression um, just during the testimony out of respect so that we can have some discussion. All right, thank you. Thank you. So my name is Roberto. And I'm the voice for a thousand of workers right now. So I'm here. Thank you. Yeah. Roberto Jacobo. Yeah. My name is Carlos Garcia Velasco. I'm a lead organizer for the construction campaign uh, at Say Tool Centro de Trabajadores Unido en la Lucha or Center for Workers United in Struggle. Okay. Okay. Mi nombre es Roberto Jacobo. Soy un miembro del Centro de Trabajadores Unido en la Lucha, CETUL que es una organización sin fines de lucro establecida en las ciudades gemelas. En CETUL tengo siete años siendo parte del Comité de Construcción y tengo tres años en la mesa directiva. Tengo 20 años trabajando en construcción en el área de remodelación. He vivido bastante robo de salario entre los 20 años. El contratista empezó a poner pretextos y quitar dinero del cheque por cuestiones de mal trabajo, según ellos. Nos esforzamos a terminar proyectos más rápido por cuestiones de ganar más dinero. Al terminar los proyectos en menos tiempo, el inversionista no pagaba lo acordado y decía que era imposible pagar esa cantidad en poco tiempo. Trabajaba hasta 12 horas por día y empezó a trabajar más horas para recuperar los sueldos que me estaban robando. Eventualmente me di cuenta de que él no solo me robaba a mí, me di cuenta que también le robaba a mi familia, le robaba a mi rentero. Le robaba a mi tienda donde yo compraba mis comidas. Me di cuenta que es un problema que afecta a toda mi comunidad, no solo mi persona. Llegó el punto que me costó la separación de mi familia. No pude pagar mi renta y mi salud empeoró al grado de no poder trabajar. Después de muchas experiencias de robo de salario, más que puedo contar, decidí tomar acción y se presentó una demanda con la ayuda de CETUL, la cual ganamos y ahora estoy comprometido y trabajando duro por el cambio del sistema donde la mayoría de los trabajadores padece de este problema. El robo de salario es tan común en algunos, piensan que es una parte normal del trabajo en construcción y cuando pasa, muchas veces por falta de información, el trabajador no sabe qué hacer, no sabe a quién acudir o a quién responder para pagar los sueldos robados. Si el contratista para el cual trabajaste desaparece o dice que no hay dinero para pagar, después de que terminaste el trabajo, ¿quién es el responsable? Otras veces no se quejan por medio de represalias, las amenazas que les van a echar al trabajador por la policía y migración. Es importante entender que estas violaciones no siguen pasando por parte de uno, dos o tres contratistas malos en, que dependen de la estructura actual para beneficiarse. Siguen pasando porque existe un sistema de explotación en construcción. 
Parece que los desarrolladores como Yellowstone, Solheim and United Properties no quieren pensar en la problemática que pasa con los trabajadores. Parece que están preocupados solamente por su dinero y ponen presión en la cadena de subcontratistas a cortar gastos y hacer el proyecto más barato. A menudo, cortando gastos resulta en contratistas y subcontratistas cortando protecciones y sueldo de los trabajadores. Si queremos evitar el robo de salario, es necesario que los desarrolladores y contratistas generales en cargo sean responsables por las prácticas del negocio, que roban del trabajador para maximizar sus ganancias. Responsabilizarlos a los contratistas generales por el robo de salario ayudará a garantizar que ya no puedan ignorar las violaciones que ocurren en esos proyectos. Aprobar esta ley marcaría una gran diferencia para los trabajadores como yo, que estamos enfrentando el robo de salario frecuentemente. Thank you so much. I will now share a testimony in English. My name is Roberto Jacobo. I am a member of CETUL, Centro de Trabajadores Unido en la Lucha, or Center for Workers United in Struggle, a nonprofit organization based in the Twin Cities metro area. I have served on the construction committee at CETUL for seven years and have been a member of the board of directors for the past three years. I have worked in construction for 20 years doing remodeling, and throughout those 20 years, I have experienced a lot of wage theft. Sometimes the contractor would take money from my check, claiming that the work wasn't done well enough. Other times, they would force us to work faster to finish a project, but then say the financiers of the project did not pay what they owed because the work, didn't, the work took long, so we would be paid less than what was promised. I was already working 12-hour days and then had to start working even longer hours to make up for the wages that were being stolen. Eventually, I realized they weren't just stealing from me. I realized that they were taking from my family, my landlord, from the store where I buy my groceries. I realized that this problem that impacts is that this is a problem that impacts my whole community, not just me. I got to the, it got to the point where it cost my family. I couldn't pay my rent. My health started to deteriorate until I could no longer work. After more instances of wage theft than I can even count, I decided to take action. With the help of Say Tool, I filed wage theft claim and I won. And now I am committed to working hard to change the system where the majority of workers are facing the same problems. Wage theft is so common that some workers think it's a normal part of working in construction. And when it happens, many times workers lack information on where to turn for help or who is responsible for paying the stolen wages. If the contractor who you work for disappears after the job is finished or says there is no money to pay, who is responsible? Other times workers fear retaliation because they are threatened with police or immigration. It is important to understand that these violations aren't because of a few bad actors. They are happening because this part of the industry runs on a, on a system of exploitation. It seems that developers uh, like Yellow Tree, Solhelm, and United Properties don't want to have to think about violations of worker rights that may occur on their projects. It seems that they are only concerned with their financial investment. They put pressure down the contracting chain to find ways to cut costs on projects. Many times cutting costs results in contractors and subcontractors cutting protections for, for, and, and wages from workers. If we want to deter wage theft, we have to hold project owners and general contractors accountable for the ways their business practices are robbing workers in order to maximize their profits. Holding general contractors responsible for wage theft will help to ensure that they can no longer ignore the violations that happen on the projects they manage. Passing this law would make a huge difference for construction workers like me who have regularly faced wage theft. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Madam Chair, the next witness is Tom Dicklick from Minnesota Building Trades. Welcome to the committee. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. 
Uh, my name is Tom Dicklich. I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota Building and Construction Trades Council. I'm here on behalf of over 70,000 members across the state. It's a privilege to be here. On behalf of the Building Trades, I'm here to speak in favor of Senate File 1988 because wage theft has, be, has been and continues to be a serious problem in the construction industry. Every day, general contractors make decisions about who does different scopes of work for them on their projects. They decide what they perform and what they subcontract out. They make decisions and are held accountable for many of those decisions from safety to worker compensation to schedule and who is paid to be on their project. Even though we passed the wage theft bill in Minnesota in 2019, nobody who works in the industry would say the problem has been solved. It's going to take all of us, who, it's going to take all of us to solve this problem. Federal, state, and local decision makers, construction trade unions, and their contractor partners. We have a track record of working together on our benefits, our joint apprenticeship programs, recruitment, and fighting for jobs. Now we need the contractors to continue to step up on this issue of workers being paid in cash under the table. It's unlawful, and what's worse, it's morally wrong. If the AGC and other contractors do not like this proposal, we want to see their counterproposal. Doing nothing is not an option when so many workers are being hurt, mistreated, and taken advantage of. It's going to take everyone working together, and I ask the Labor Committee and the Senate to pass this legislation. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you for your testimony. And uh, Senator Seberger, do you have any other testifiers that you'd like us to hear I, I, before I go to, to the list that I have? Sure, there's nobody else on my list, Madam Chair. Okay, very good. Um, next on um, the list that the committee has is Tim Work. Welcome to the Senate Labor Committee, Mr. Work. And um, if you'd please introduce yourself for the record and your um, title and affiliation. We look forward to hearing your testimony. Certainly, Madam Chair, and good evening, committee members. My name is Tim Warkey, and I am the Chief Executive of the Associated General Contractors of Minnesota. AGC of Minnesota represents over 350 commercial contractors, subcontractors, and suppliers. We're the state's oldest and largest commercial construction association having been in existence for over 100 years. Our members are commercial contractors and they do not perform signal, single family residential construction. And additionally, over 80% of our members are signed to a collective bargaining agreement. As illustration, I'm proud to say that one of our most prominent members built the building that we are sitting in today. Some key points I wish to present regarding the proposal in front of you. And let me begin by clearly stating that AGC unequivocally, unequivocally condemns and does not condone wage theft, period. Our position on this bill is that the legislation as currently written is misguided, misdirected, and places heavy burdens on upstream contractors with significant market-based consequences. We believe that efforts to curb wage theft are best focused on building out the 2019 wage theft law and fully funding the current Department of Labor and Industries $3 million budget request for wage and hour investigative staff. Over the past six to eight years, there have been several major legislative initiatives enacted, each promising to end wage theft. We do not need more legislation. We need more funding and a commitment to make the existing laws work. Further, we have yet to see any tangible evidence that the approach pr proposed here and enacted in a handful of other states, as you have heard, has made any meaningful impact on the progress of curbing wage theft. Madam Chair, to the bill specifically, first I want to address the principle of basic fairness in the imposition of strict liability that this bill brings to bear. The bill shifts the legal responsibility for the criminal actions of downstream parties onto the upstream general contractor, regardless of fault or negligence, regardless of fault or negligence. Upstream contractors do not control the hiring of downstream sub-tier contractors, and they further lack the complicity or the responsibility for the negligent and illegal actions of those subs. The application of strict liability in this manner is without precedent 
and is something our members will not support. At its core, contracting is about managing and then pricing risk. Because no insurance product exists to cover the strict liability imposed on upstream contractors from the negligent or criminal actions of their downstream partners, upstream contractors will be left to price that risk into their project proposals to cover that exposure. This will lead to significant cost increases for construction services. Secondly, our concern is unintended consequences. Specifically, we raise the issue of a shared obligation to promote equity in public contracting and construction. If this bill passes, it is likely general contractors will be less likely to take on an unknown or unfamiliar project partner when having to shoulder the risks and penalty burdens. Additionally, the compliance requirements will fall disproportionately across small and emerging businesses who lack resources to collect and provide the employment data that a general contractor will demand. Upstream contractors will now likely demand a performance bond, or payment bond, excuse me, from unfamiliar partners to protect against the risks of wage theft or other violations. The demand for this bond will severely limit the capacity of minority business enterprises and emerging small businesses who will be challenged to afford the premium of that bond or simply will not qualify for that security interest. Creating additional barriers to onboarding WMBE contractors is not something that AGC of Minnesota supports. Finally, our concern is about administrative burden that the bill will impose on upstream contractors for collecting and managing the data. Significant unaddressed questions remain regarding responsibility for late, non-responsive, or non-compliant downstream project partners. What if a downstream partner refuses to supply all or any of the required information? The leverage in the bill that the bill provides is withholding of payment. I can only imagine the disputes that will arise when the accuracy and sufficiency of the information is called into question and payments are suspended. Further, there is no discernible way for the upstream contractor, the general, to be made aware when or if the violations are occurring so that the GC can stop payment and limit their exposure to the ongoing wage theft activity. The bill allows claims or from third party causes of action to be brought up to three years, three years after an alleged violation has occurred. What happens if the responsible downstream subcontractor goes out of business and closes their door following project completion and has failed to make the necessary wage payments? Does the GC now assume that responsibility? We think that's patently unfair in the construct of this bill. You can clearly see the challenges that we have with embracing the construct of the bill. Madam Chair, in closing, we believe if the bill passes, construction service costs will increase. In turn, that will stunt the economic development at a time when it is crucial to create jobs and promote economic growth while further reducing opportunities for minority and women-owned businesses. AGC of Minnesota will continue to raise these concerns and others until we can be assured those concerns have been satisfactor satisfactorily addressed for the entirety of our membership contractors. Madam Chair, that concludes my remarks. I appreciate the opportunity to testify. Thank you for your testimony. Next on our list of testifiers, we have Wendy Sullivan. Welcome to the Senate Labor Committee, Ms. Sullivan. If you would introduce yourself and any affiliation you'd like to um, have on the record, and then we look forward to your testimony. Madam Chair and members of the committee, my name is Wendy Sullivan. I'm the founder and owner and operator of Wenrich PD Construction. I'm a commercial heavy highway construction company that does fencing um, and mainly works on public jobs. 
Um, I'm a certified woman-owned and minority-owned business, um, small disadvantaged business, um, and have been signatory to the union. Um, I wanted to, when I heard about this in a meeting at AGC, um, I wanted to come and speak and talk about how the balance of this uh, bill would be for a small business like mine. Um, Tim Workey, before I came on, uh, uh, spoke about some of them. Um, first of all, just in hearing about it, my first concern is just based on principle that each business, including my own, are responsible for their own, the, how they operate their business and whether they pay their employees properly or not. Um, and th that is who should be responsible for that. Um, I do not feel it's fair, um, even speaking for myself as a small subcontractor, that the general contractor would be responsible if I did not take care of my responsibilities. I am responsible for my business and, and me alone. Um, and secondly, um, the barriers that it would create, and I think there needs to be a balance. I think workers are very much, they're very important. And I think the stories that I heard today were saddening and, and not good. But also on the balance of that as a small business, whenever there's a change, the small business has to take the brunt of that. We have to balance that out. And so if there are gonna be, we, it's so difficult as a small business to break into construction, especially on my end with Highway Heavy, and for me to get in there and then have to try to, another barrier to come to overcome and be in a small business, um, there will be, they'll ask for a bond for sure because they're not gonna wanna take a chance with me to make sure that I'm paying. And then if I, I can't even qualify for a bond, so that knocks me out. So all of the efforts that are put forth um, from the state to try to have inclusion, this creates a barrier and actually excludes small businesses. Um, I think that when you're asked to upstream, they're going to, the general contractors are going to choose people that they're more comfortable with and that they're, they're used to using, that they can be assured. And so that will, that will keep a lot of emerging businesses out. That will keep a lot of minority businesses out who are small that they haven't had a chance to, uh, uh, to grow their business at that point. And so those opportunities for business will be lessened. Um, and also... In order to enforce this, um, I think there'll be a lot of extra added paperwork. And when you're a small business, you're wearing a lot of hats. And it's difficult now to even provide the things that are required. And if there's additional paperwork that has to be done, that puts another burden on the small business. And although, again, I think the workers being paid is very important, I also think there needs to be a balance and a consideration um, when, when, um, when a bill is coming forth on how is it gonna affect everyone that's involved in the process? Like how is that gonna affect a small business who's trying to make it in this industry? It is so difficult. I'm after nine years uh, still trying to overcome a certain barrier or, or a certain uh, threshold and it's difficult to get jobs and this will make it even more difficult to do that. Um, and I guess I, I think that's all that I have to say and I thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Um, next up in our list of testifiers, we have um, John Besch. And I'm, then, then after uh, Mr. Besch, uh, if you'd come up. Um, and uh, we have two Zoom testifiers, just so people know they're next. Um, Stephen Yoke, or Yoch, um, just so you know that you're on deck. And then Bill um, Gishwind. So, um, and, I, and I just want to make sure that everybody who wants to testify gets an opportunity to testify. So I'm going to just keep an eye on the, on the clock and make sure everybody gets their, their um, testimony in. And um, I'm just, I'll ask people in as much as you can to keep your, your comments concise. I know we had um, some of our testimony earlier, of course, with the translators. We needed a little bit more time for that. But um, with that... Thank you, uh, and welcome again um, to the Labor Committee. Uh, if you would just state your name and your affiliation for the record, and we look forward to your testimony. Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is, for the record, John Beshe. I'm with Associated Builders and Contractors of Minnesota. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on Senate File 1988. ABC's 330 commercial and industrial contractor members and the 20,000 men and women they employ are part of the 76% of the construction industry in Minnesota that choose to be merit shop craft professionals rather than be in a union. 
ABC is opposed to Senate File 1988, which would require general contractors to assume the liability for any unpaid wages or fringe benefits owed by a subcontractor of any tier. When the 2019 wage theft bill was signed into law, advocates celebrated it as one of the toughest wage theft laws in the country. It was supposed to provide the Department of Labor and the Attorney General with the tools needed to crack down on wage theft, and it created a criminal liability for intentional fraudulent wage theft acts. Now, I want to be absolutely clear that ABC does not condone wage theft. However, Senate File 1988 will only punish merit shop contractors while providing carve outs for union contractors and contractors on prevailing wage projects. Senate File 1988 makes general contractors jointly and severally liable for unpaid wages, benefits, and liquidated damages owed to a claimant by a subcontractor at any tier. If a subcontractor is unable or refuses to pay, then the general contractor is stuck with the costs. This approach puts 100% of the labor risk on the general contractor, and it essentially destroys the value and purpose of a subcontract. This assumption of liability is unfair to general contractors who have no knowledge of what may have transpired between subcontractors and their employees. The general contractor does not sit on the HR or accounting divisions of the dozens and dozens of subcontractors that they work with on every single project. The effect of this bill is to eliminate the general contractor subcontractor legal relationship in terms of liability and to essentially punish innocent parties for the alleged bad actions of others. You know, it's been said that this bill is needed to tilt the playing field so that it is even between general contractors and employees. However, we find it interesting that these concerns seem to only apply to non-union general contractors, as the bill explicitly permits the assumption of liability to be waived by a collective bargaining agreement with the trade union. It's unclear why union contractors should be allowed to exempt themselves from a requirement that will apply to the remaining 76% of the commercial and industrial construction industry. Is wage theft not an issue at union job sites? If it isn't, then compliance with the requirements of this bill should not be an issue. From a practical standpoint, if the requirements of this bill can be waived by a collective bargaining agreement, that means that a general contractor who hires a union subcontractor would have to assume liability without legal recourse to recover from that union subcontractor. The likely result will be that merit shop contractors will avoid doing business with union subcontractors out of fear that they may need to assume the liability for wages with no legal recourse. Is that really the in intended result? Or result? This will also have an impact on new subcontractors that are trying to enter the field because the general contractor will have no knowledge of alleged wage theft until after it occurs. General contractors will limit subcontracts to only those who they've worked with in the past. I'd also note that the liability requirements in this bill do not apply to prevailing wage projects. Uh, similar to the other carve out, does the fact that a project pays prevailing wage really mean that wage theft is less likely to occur? This is another example of how this bill does not create an even playing field. Uh, my final point is that it is unclear as to whether this bill requires general contractors to assume only the civil liability or the full criminal liability that is uh, authorized under Minnesota wage theft law. We would ask for clarification on this point, and if it does apply to criminal liability, we think it's extremely unfair for a general contractor to be held criminally liable for acts that may be outside of their control. Rather than holding bad actors accountable, Senate File 1988 creates an uneven playing field where certain general contractors are forced to assume the liability of unpaid wages owed by subcontractors while others are free to conduct business as usual. In closing, we urge the committee to vote no on Senate File 1988. Thank you once again, Madam Chair and members of the committee for the opportunity to testify. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Beshi. Uh, next, we have Stephen Yoke or Yoch on uh, Zoom. Can you hear us, sir? I can. Thank you very much, and thank, thank you, you, Madam Chairman, and the committee. Can you hear me? We can. We can see you and hear you. Thank Great. you. Thank you. I'm I'm very grateful, Madam Chairman, for the opportunity to testify regarding this bill. I'm with the Fellhaber Law Firm in Minneapolis, and I've represented dozens of general contractors and subcontractors, many dozens over the years, and have written extensively on real estate and construction issues. Yet this is the first time that I've ever testified before a House or Senate committee, because I believe this proposed bill represents an existential threat to many of the small general contractors who play a crucial role in providing the important needs for affordable housing. As you likely know, Minnesota already 
has some of the most rigorous warranty statutes in the country, in particular 327A, which requires general contractors to provide extensive warranties to homeowners, and those general contractors include warranting the subcontractor's work. Minnesota also requires that contractors who are paid money from an owner take that money in trust and in turn must pay their subcontractors and suppliers. If indeed a general contractor fails to forward those payments, they're subject to criminal liability under Chapter 514.02. Minnesota, as we, has been discussed repeatedly today, already has in place for contractors and general contractors statutes that require employees to be paid, as Mr. Workey noted. The current statutory framework creates very substantial protection for homeowners, for employees, but what the proposed bill will do is compel legally or compel small businesses to audit and review subcontractors' records and assume liability for something that's fundamentally outside their control. I think it's important to note that our border states will benefit from this legislation. Builders can continue to shift their homeowner and other construction projects out to western Wisconsin where affordable housing can be constructed without the burdens of this bill. And while I doubt it's the bill's intent, it will inevitably benefit large national builders, many of whom are from outside the state, who will be able to absorb some of these administrative costs and in turn pass those costs on to consumers. This will result in for further consolidation of the residential construction industry and higher prices to consumers. What this bill proposes, though, is fundamentally different than the warranty statute that I mentioned a second ago. Under that statute, a general contractor is liable for the work of a subcontractor, but there's no personal liability to the general contractor. The bill, as written, says the contractor is responsible for unpaid wages. The Minnesota Department of Revenue fact sheets defines wage payment obligations to include withholdings. Here, if the withholdings are not made by the subcontractor, the general contractor could share in that personal joint and several liability, again, for which it has no control. Even if a general contractor goes to the expense and effort of an audit has been noted, it won't immunize them from liability under this bill. A negligent or fraudulent subcontractor could simply shirk their responsibilities and push that liability onto an innocent general contractor who would have no way of knowing that the records provided by the subcontractor were fraudulent or deficient. There's always been narrow exceptions in the law for holding parties responsible when they have control or they've engaged in fraud. This legislation now seeks to apply to third parties over which they have no control. I certainly see this as an area ripe for potential litigation, given the tremendous adverse in impact on the entire housing industry. Minnesota already has one of the most closely regulated home construction industries in the country. I respectfully believe this bill is unworkable, harmful, and unnecessary and should be rejected. Thank you, Madam Chairman and the committee for your time. I appreciate the opportunity to testify. Thank you for your testimony. Next up, um, we have Bill Gishwind on Zoom as well. I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your last name. If you would kindly. Oh, you're pronouncing it correctly. Um, my camera was working fine before, but right now it doesn't seem to want to start. So if you can hear me okay, I'll speak without uh, the camera and continue to try to get, uh, get the thing to, to kick in here. Sure. Um, uh, sir, could you? Okay. Um, since we don't have you on visual, could you please um, state your name and any affiliation that you have for the record? And also, could you just maybe let us know where you're testifying from for the record, too? Thank you. Absolutely, Madam Chair. Uh, uh, thank you and, and for the opportunity to talk with you today about the uh, SF-1988 and the issue of wage theft. My name is Bill Geschwind. I'm the founder of Minnesota Construction Law Services. Uh, my firm represents owner-operated contractors at all tiers, both residential and commercial. Um, I am uh, an active member of Housing First Minnesota, Associated Builders and Contractors, and National Association of the Remodeling Industry. Um, I think I can say with 100% confidence that uh, the vast majority of contractors in the industry are great businesses, and, and, and the thousands of contractors that I work with uh, through these associations and the hundreds that we represent in our firm are collectively appalled at wage theft, and it breaks my heart, I'm sure, as it does yours, to hear some of the stories we heard earlier today. But my heart also aches to hear some of the testifiers today paint with such a broad brush and would have you believe that wage, wage theft is endemic in the, in the construction industry such that 
we would have to have a bill such as SF 1988 that imposes such severe penalties on, on contractors who have nothing to do with wage theft and are working hard every day to make sure it doesn't occur. We heard a number of times that one in five construction workers may face wage theft. Uh, in all the years I've, I've been involved in this, I've, I have rarely heard of wage theft issues occurring with the contractors that we work with. Does it exist out there? It absolutely does. And I don't deny that, that any of the testifiers' stories um, occurred and that they're, they're heartbreaking and they shouldn't occur, but the industry is working hard to make sure that this doesn't happen. Uh, the, the independent contractors were suggested as an intentional strategy designed to exploit immigrants. I think that that is a, a horrendous statement to have been made. Um, independent contractors are people like you and, and people like your neighbors who have motivation to start their own businesses and to run their own operations. They're good, honest people and they want to work hard and they take care of their employees. They're not exploiting people as a routine in the industry. This bill does not offer the kind of protection that um, it, it's represented to, 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 to offer. What it does is it penalizes a large swath of contractors who are doing nothing wrong and are, are fighting to prevent wage theft in the industry. In my experience, the subcontractors and their laborers don't feel exploited. In fact, they choose to be merit shop. They choose to be independent contractors. They choose to be employed by the employers that they work with um, at the wage levels that those employers offer under the, the um, opportunities that those employers provide for them. Um, some of the supporters we heard earlier promulgate the misperception that most contractors are stealing from workers who aren't paid prevailing wage, aren't paid union wage, and that somehow that's a, that's a, a necessary business strategy in order for them to be profitable. Um, that's just not a good representation, not even a close representation to what the majority of contractors that we work with every day that are out building Minnesota, building the buildings you're sitting in, building your homes. It, it, it is not a representative of, of the way these people work. We already have a significant number of laws to address the illegal behavior of the few contractors who don't respect their workers. And I think the testimony of the ABC rep, or I'm sorry, the AGC rep that was in earlier, it said, you know, we support the enforcement. We support the Department of Labor utilizing the laws that were passed in, in 2019. To, to resolve these problems. You know, going after a contractor for the um, failure of someone downstream to pay their employees would be a little bit like putting the patrons of a bank in the prison because the robber couldn't be caught and, the, and they happened to be in the bank and didn't do enough to stop the robber from getting out. It's, a, it's penalizing the wrong person for the wrong acts. And, you know, a contractor's most rational response to, 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 to 1988 would actually be to choose the well-established, known, and trusted subs. I think that was mentioned earlier. These laborers most likely to be hurt by this very bill are the entrepreneurial, disadvantaged workers who see construction jobs as their way up. It's their opportunity to get a good job. It's their opportunity to start their own business. Some of them may only start a business with themselves as the owner, but some of them may very well start their business with themselves and then begin adding additional employees to grow their business out. Excuse me, Mr. Mr. Gishwind. I very much like to thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today, um, I, and I would ask that that SF nineteen eighty eight not be advanced beyond your committee. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your testimony, sir. Um, and and as our last um, testifier today, we have Brooke Bordson. Welcome to the Senate Labor Committee. If you could please introduce yourself and your affiliation and title, and we look forward to your testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I appreciate the opportunity to testify today. My name is Brooke Bordson, and I'm with the League of Minnesota Cities, which represents uh, 837 cities across the state. I wanted to just briefly touch on some concerns um, about the bill from the perspective of cities. Under the new definitions in the bill, a city as a project owner could be deemed a contractor in certain circumstances and liable for all claims as such. Our concern is that cities could end up using public funds to pay for certain costs twice if a contractor didn't pay a subcontractor a claimant or payment was in dispute. Because, projects, because public projects are funded with taxpayer dollars, 
Municipalities are subject to unique requirements under the state's uniform municipal contracting law. For most con construction projects, over $175,000, a city has to bid out the project and accept the lowest responsible bid. Thus, cities are not allowed much discretion in selecting a contractor. We believe these re regulations that apply specifically to municipalities should be taken into consideration when determining whether to make a city financially responsible for a contractor's actions. The Uniform Municipal Contracting Law also requires projects over $175,000 to include a payment bond, and that's in Statute 574.26. For projects where a payment bond has been obtained, subcontractors and workers can make a claim against the bond for wages they're owed. And we would request that language be added to the bill stating that these new provisions would not apply to claimants, to allow claimants to seek payment from a city when a city has required a contractor to provide a payment bond. Without this exception, there may be confusion about um, whether a claimant would file two claims for payment, one from the city and one under the bond how the process of that would be determined, um, or even if a bond company could deny a payment to a claimant who's requested payment from the city, uh, which would essentially negate the purpose of the payment bond. In summary, we're concerned that the effects of the bill uh, could pose a financial risk to cities as they plan for and incorporate projects into their budgets. And we also have some questions about how a city would be able to verify the validity of a claim it might receive. This could be especially burdensome on smaller cities with limited staff and smaller budgets. Um, I want to thank Senator Seberger for taking the time to talk with me yesterday, and I'm certainly happy to work with the authors and stakeholders going forward. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And um, those are all of the testifiers that we have on our list for today. Uh, Senator Seberger, would you like to offer any final words before we begin our discussion in committee? Uh, not at this time. I guess I'll wait for any questions or discussion from the committee members. Very good. All right. Um, members, we heard a lot of testimony uh, today, and um, I want to open it up to discussion. Yes, Senator Dornick. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, first, I want to thank you for the good big crowd that we have here, so thank you for coming. Thank you so much to the testifiers that uh, testified both on both sides. That, that's what we do is point and counterpoint to listen, and uh, it's not always easy to, uh, to work through that. Um, but I also want to say that every one of us up here condemns wage theft. There's not a single person up here that supports that. Um, and it's, it's, some of the stories are, are just uh, very sad, and uh, we're, I'm just very disappointed that there's contractors that do that. Uh, saying that, um, I actually am a carpenter and uh, worked as a local uh, in the Carpenters Union down in Rochester for many years. So I support the union labor. I appreciate the, the work they do, the training they give, and uh, the work that you guys all and gals do. And actually, I got to meet somebody I worked with about 20 years ago that's out in the audience. That's pretty cool. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, so thank you. Uh, but also, uh, in 2009, I got laid off and became a general contractor. So I walk on both sides, and I, I appreciate and support both sides, both uh, the union and non-union. I, I didn't want to leave. I got laid off, and with the economy so bad, uh, my union, I said, it'd be two years before I come back. And I'm like, I, I, this is all I have. And they said, you need to do what you need to do for your family. So, so that's why I went to be a general contractor and, and work in the residential field. So um, moving on to this, uh, where I'm at now, and um, trying to work through this and the speed of much of the legislation. So I just got this bill. If it wouldn't have been for my good friend Adam Dunnick, I wouldn't have known about this till Monday, which was yesterday. So to try to digest all of this in just a few days or a few hours amongst all the other, we're all busy. Our schedules are really a lot of stuff happening. It's just really difficult. So I'm a little frustrated at the speed and, and we're supposed to make a decision on this right away with all the testimony and all the lives and the businesses and all the people that affects. That's why we have a House and Senate and the, the original intent was always to sift it back and forth and work through so we don't have those unattended consequences. So, uh, Senator Seberger, my, my door is open. I, I uh, appealed to you last time at the refinery bill, 
and uh, I didn't hear anything. Um, so refinery bill is, is going through and it's getting those stakeholders together. That's always my goal, to make the bill the best that we can make it for both sides. And so that's what I want to do here. Um, so I would like to bring, if, if I can, Madam Chair, uh, ask uh, Adam Dunnick and Mr. I think it was Tim Werke, is he still here? So I got a couple questions for you guys, um, if that's okay. Yes, if um, two gentlemen can join us at the testifier table, thank you. And um, yes, Senator Dornick, go ahead with your questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Dunnick and Mr. Werke. I appreciate both testimonies. Um, so there's a problem. I think both of you admit there's a problem. So I guess uh, as a carpenter and, and we're problem solvers and there's always different ways we can accomplish the goal. So I guess I'm looking at, uh, so we have, a, we have a problem here. I know one thing that was brought up, I think by Mr. Werke was the recover, let's see, which was the, the fund, uh, the fully, let's see, the wage investigating fund. So I'd like to hear a little bit about that from you, Mr. Werke, and then the counterpoint from, uh, or information from you, Mr. Dunnick, on that. Mr. Werke. Madam Chair, could I ask the Senator to expound on that? I'm not familiar with what you're talking about. I was thinking, well, maybe it wasn't you. Uh, sorry, Madam yeah, Chair. Senator Dornick, perhaps a little bit more detail about okay, what you're so asking for. Okay, so I think it was you in the to testimony. You talked about the wage investigating, and I was running it, writing as fast as I could, and there was $3 million. It's not fully oh, funded. Okay. I, was, that, was that you? Yeah. Mr. Madam, Madam Chair, Senator, yes. Um, I understand that the Department of Labor and Industry currently has a budget request in, in front of the legislature for somewhere around an additional $3 million to fund investigative staff uh, within the agency. And the 2019 wage theft law, which, uh, as noted, is one of the most stringent in the nation, um, had, has built into it a multitude of checks and investigatory authority, including criminal penalties, including providing the attorney general with criminal prosecutorial powers, and including making it a criminal offense for <laughs> contractors to knowingly um, engage subcontractors uh, who have um, a history of violations and requires those contractors, general contractors, to, I believe, I'm not sure about the wording, but to um, require a sworn or, or an attestation from all of their subs that they have not engaged in wage theft um, and have criminal violations on their record. And so our position is that that law, which has yet to be fully fully uh, vetted out and fully implemented, needs an opportunity to be able to be fully funded uh, and, and to move forward, rather than proceeding uh, with additional um, statutory authorities that uh, we have challenges with. Thank you, Mr. Werke. And um, Mr. Dunnick, uh, would you also like an opportunity to respond? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair and Senator. Uh, I wouldn't add a little bit uh, to what Mr. Werke said. I would just say when the original bill passed, there was $3.1 or $3.2 million per biennium for Department of Labor and Industry to put together a wage theft investigative unit. That ha happened. There was some disruption around COVID in terms of staffing up and hiring investigators. I think that delayed some of it. Uh, but for all the talk about how strong the bill was, and I'm proud of how strong the bill was because I helped work pretty hard on it. Our organization did a lot for it. Our members stood up a lot for it. There have been zero cases in construction. There have been zero cases brought forward since 2019. And I think every testifier we heard from tonight said wage theft is happening. We know it exists. There's a question of how much and where, but it's happening. And so the fact that we have this great bill, but there have been zero cases brought forward, I think also begs the question, what more can we do? Senator Dornick. Madam Chair, uh, so expound on that. Why, why is it not working or why is there zero? Is, is it a fear of... Recall or what? Yeah. So just tell me why that. 
Yeah, Madam Chair and Senator, my strong Bill. belief is that the uh, dynamic between a worker who is in a position that they're being paid cash under the table or exploited and their direct employer who at times is potentially either a mystery to them or con purposefully confused which person is their direct employer. Sometimes the workers that we're talking to not only work for somebody but actually get their housing through that same person. So if they stand up to their boss, they don't know where they're going to sleep that night. When that dynamic doesn't change, then we need to figure out how to fix the relationship between worker and employer. And that's why our idea is the general contractor. Maybe is isn't a perfect idea, but we think it's better than the dynamic that, that exists today. Senator Jordan, follow up. Madam Chair, yes, thank you. Um, so I guess I would uh, just continue on with both of you and Senator Seberger if you have uh, something to add to. Uh, so on other states that have implemented this, I mentioned, I think you mentioned seven or eight. Um, is this a template for a specific one or is there nuances and something we can learn that maybe this bill to me, it needs more work. I'm, I'm, I'm not against it at all. It just, there's, there's more things. So, um, so just whoever wants to answer that, um, where do we get the template and, and how much difference are there from state to state? Uh, Madam Mr. Chair and yes. Senator, just it, I can take a shot at that. We took what we thought were some of the best ideas from all the different states. Uh, the only state that's really been in place for quite a while is California since 2017. The other states have only passed it within the last one to three years. So it's something to, for us to continue to monitor and see how well it's working in those states. Uh, we've seen positive improvements in the climate in those states, in, in the contracting world. We have not seen that the sky is falling or that uh, construction companies are not able to exist or those sorts of things, those sorts of negative comment, uh, comments that were raised tonight. We'll, you know, we'll continue to monitor what happens in those other states and we feel good about the policy. Thank you. Any follow-up, Senator Dornick? Thank you, Madam Chair. So I don't know if, uh, Mr. Workey, if you had any, any thoughts, if you have, know of any information on the states either that you've looked at. Mr. Workey? Madam Chair, I cannot speak to that. I, we have asked um, for that information. Um, we, would at, we would like to see discernible, meaningful action and how those actions have played out in other states, but we have yet to be presented with that. I know that, that Adam, uh, we had a discussion yesterday and indicated that they would be working to try to, to discover that. Madam Chair, if I might just briefly, I think it bears uh, mentioning in the context of this discussion that this industry is not devoid of multiple attempts to wrestle with this vexing problem. We have worked hard and I've been directly involved going back more than 10 years, testifying, working with our partners in labor on multiple efforts to try to, to wrangle this thing so that we can stop wage theft. This started more than 10 years ago with changes to the independent contractor statute and what defines an independent contractor. It subsequently moved into efforts with the Secretary of State in trying to um, better define what a LLC is, a limited liability corporation. From there, six or eight years ago, we passed the Responsible Contractor Act, which is a significant law that was, is full of various penalties and consequences for violations of wage and hour and prevailing wage and other uh, related initiatives. We had to come back the subsequent year and, and take care of unintended consequences. It was my association that had to carry those unintended consequences, which we warned clearly that there would be. Then we stepped into the world of wage theft law. We passed the wage theft law three years ago. We also were partners in building that law, indicating strongly that there would be unintended consequences. And we have had to come back and deal with those unintended consequences again, with my association having to lead efforts to fix those flaws. And here we are again today talking about far more significant consequences. We're talking about strict liability being imposed on a general contractor for actions for which they do not carry negligent responsibility for on part of their partners. I would simply like to say if this bill pass, we will be back here next year with significant requests for fixes. 
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rookie. Um, does it, do either the lead author of the bill or Mr. Dunnock have any further comment? Madam Chair. Okay. Yes, uh, Senator Umar Verbetten. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, first, I just wanted to say thank you to all of our union brothers, sisters, siblings for being here with us today. It's great to see you. And I just fundamentally disagree with this argument that our general contractors don't know what's going on. Um, the first story we heard about was the Viking Lakes project. And I know the Carpenters Union warned those folks and they went ahead just to try to save some money. And people, there's labor trafficking that goes on, the sexual assault that happened there, it all could have been avoided. And frankly, general contractors do need to be held responsible. Like you, you need to know what your subcontractors are doing and you need to hold those folks responsible. Um, I just wanted to read a few lines from these great letters that we received as well. First is from uh, Verona Companies that says, responsible general contractors are accountable for the projects they build in just about every way and are able to differentiate between subcontractors who pay their workers legitimately versus those who utilize labor brokers to take advantage of cash pay workforce. They know. Um, we also hear from a subcontractor, Frida Drywall Systems, which I believe is a woman-owned business, um, that general contractors control the projects they build, they choose the subcontractors, they can tell the difference between subcontractors who have a business model of exploiting their workforce and the honest business. And I know, again, that folks have been warning them, people continue to make these decisions, and I think this bill is a great way to actually hold them accountable. They're gonna have to think twice before going with these, with these subcontractors who are exploiting workers. Thank you, Senator Mover Benton. Any further discussion? Senator Dornick. Madam, yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. So I'll just wrap up with uh, uh, just a couple of things that were brought up about the civil liability, criminal liability, and some of the issues about the cities, uh, League of Cities that brought, brought that up. If there's some of those things that uh, the author is uh, willing to work on and uh, work with those stakeholders and, and make the bill, um, address these concerns. Senator Seberger, uh, do you have any uh, comments? And are, Well, actually, I should, uh, Senator Dornick, is that all that you had? No, or was that a question? That's a question, yeah. Okay, Senator Seberger. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Dornick, I, my door is always open. The stakeholders are continuing to discuss how to make this bill better. Um, what we do want is the best bill we can possibly end up with, um, and those conversations continue. And I will note, um, uh, at, at least we have it marked down that this bill is next headed to judiciary. So when we start getting into the realm of, of civil remedies and that sort of thing, I think that that's something that that committee is going to look at. Senator Dornick, follow up? Yeah, I was going to offer the A6 amendment. Okay, if we could have the A6 amendment passed out, and while we're doing that, um, to your A6 amendment, Senator Yeah, Dornick. this is just uh, 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 just an option, a um, suggestion. Um, I think there's obviously some things that needs to be done. Uh, support the uh, stopping wage theft and, and to, to, to deal with those bad actors, uh, those bad contractors that are, are breaking law. Um, so this one basically is kind of just a, uh, to the residential contractors, kind of, and I'm going to pull the amendment, I just wanted to talk about it a little bit, just to, to throw something out, it's like there's always uh, some thoughts and options that uh, we can come up with. So this is already in place, but uh, this is just a recovery fund, and as a general contractor, we all pay into that with our, our license fee, and then... Um, what they do is if a homeowner is uh, contractor does something wrong or uh, and there's a claim uh, and the contractor is a bad actor, there's a way, I mean, hopefully we'll deal with that guy too, but um, that they can recover their losses. So, and that's kind of what I'm just uh, trying to propose that 
Maybe something like that would work for the residential part of it. A commercial, I know uh, with talking to Mr. Dunnick, it was, we're talking lots of money, so I don't think that would work in the commercial and some of the stuff is happening there. But um, again, just some different options. Um, this is just one for the residential contractors. Um, and that's all it is, so I, Madam Chair, I'm gonna pull the amendment. amendment. I just wanna talk about that and just some of the other things that uh, we can maybe come up with some ideas. So I'm hoping that uh, uh, Mr. Dunnick and I'm not sure if Tim or, or I'm sorry, Mr. Werke, um, that you guys will commit to working together and, uh, and uh, hopefully getting some of these issues that are, and sorry, Senator Seberger too, uh, and all the other stakeholders that are involved to uh, make this bill so we don't have those unintended consequences. So thank you so much again for your testimonies, for, for being here and for all you guys being so patient. So with Madam Chair, I'll, I'll stop. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Dornick. The E6 amendment is withdrawn after being offered um, pending some further discussion. Um, and uh, Senator Pappas. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Sieberger. Um, I think I'm um, a little confused about the comments that uh, Ms. Bordson made from the League of Minnesota Cities because we do um, about what actually an owner is as opposed to a general contractor. So I think that some discussion with her Know, about what that is before judiciary would be a good idea to just kind of clarify because you know in the bonding world we give a lot of money to cities to build things and so we want to make sure where the liability lies that it lies with the general contractor not with the city thank you thank you senator pappas um yes go ahead senator grunhagen well thank you madam chair thank oops We'll try it this way. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, uh, thanks for the testifiers too, and I especially appreciate the people working in the trades. You actually get things done and make the economy grow, uh, both union and non-union. So thank you for doing that. We need more people in the trades, not less. I would uh, parrot the same comments. We want to avoid uh, wage theft. It's wrong, and uh, none of us support that, okay? I don't think anybody in the room it sounds like they support it. But I do have a few concerns about this. Uh, it was also stated there's no insurance that exists for a general contractor to take out to cover his liability. So if uh, Senator Seberger or someone would respond to that, uh, I'd like to see what, uh, what the response is to that. Senator Seberger. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Grunhagen, um, are you, Talking about insurance coverage for the, the wage piece? For the liability, yeah. Senator, can you repeat that, Senator Grunhagen? Oh. oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, for the, uh, for the uh, liability portion. Senator Seberger. Okay. Of the wage piece of a subcontractor, it was stated that there is no existing insurance and that that would just completely fall on the general contractor. Senator Seberger. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, Senator Grunhagen. Um, I'm unaware if there is a wage exclusion in commercial general liability policies, so I don't know that that's an accurate statement. On the other hand, um, this bill does provide for joint and several liability, so to the extent that a contractor, a general contractor, is held liable for wages paid by, or sh that should have been paid by a subcontractor, that general can go after the sub. It, Senator Grunhagen. Yeah, it would be uh, good to know if there is insurance available and how it would apply in this particular situation because obviously it leaves the general contractor uh, responsible for downstream subcontractors, and there might be a whole host of them. So um, the other thing uh, that I would say based on the testimony it sounds like we have some very tough wage theft laws, okay? In fact, I, in the House, I remember them being passed. I can't remember if I voted for or against it, but I know they passed. And uh, it seems like, and uh, uh, Mr. Dunnick seemed to acknowledge that with COVID, even though we have zero uh, uh, prosecutions, 
that with COVID, it did kind of throw a monkey wrench into the system. To me, we should get the Department of Labor and even the Attorney General here and find out why uh, they're not implementing that law in a, better, uh, in a better way rather than passing one more law on top of another one. It's just an initial thought. And I do think that the additional $3 million, if it's spent on hiring investigators to look into this and a general awareness of uh, workers on where they can file complaints if they have a wage theft situation uh, would be a better path to try versus coming down with another law on top of the laws we already have. It seems like we've got some tough laws. It just seems like uh, they're not being enforced. And that seems to be where the problem is, more so than that, that we need an additional law. Those are just some of my conclusions based on the testimony. Um, I do have a couple of amendments that I would like to offer to address those. And the first one would be an A2 amendment. Okay, Senator, yes, yeah, so if we could have that handed out and Senator, you can go ahead to your um, A2 amendment. Okay, what the A2 amendment does, it's line, page four, line 32. And basically in there it says, uh, we, well, Subdivision 3 talks about civil actions, and then it says, in the case of the action against a subcontractor, the contractor shall be jointly and severably liable for any unpaid wages, benefits, and any other remedies available pursuant to this section. And what my amendment does, after the period, it says, only if the contractor has actual knowledge of a violation or violations of this section, unpaid wages or benefits, or a miscalculation of, of uh, the workers' uh, pay and benefits. So it basically gives a little bit of, uh, of uh, flexibility to the general contractor that, you know, I mean, in some of these situations, especially larger, larger ones, it's a, uh, you know, a subcontractor to a subcontractor to a subcontractor to a subcontractor, you know, depending on what needs to be done. And I just think, to think that the general contractor has to be held liable for all of that uh, is a little bit step too far. And I think that if we can get the enforcement of our current wage theft laws, I think it'll go a long ways to addressing the, some of the problems that we heard here. So uh, I would appreciate uh, Senator Seberger's perspective on this amendment, uh, Madam Chair. Senator Seberger. Thank you, Madam Chair, Senator Grunwald. Um, Having just been given this amendment, and I do see there was an email that I think went out shortly after this hearing started. Um, I'm not inclined to accept any amendments that aren't presented to me in advance of the hearing and giving me a chance to um, process and fully understand them. My thoughts in having looked at this um, here right now is a general contractor is for the most part in charge of the project and saying that a general contractor should be in charge of, for example, safety and uh, OSHA regulations and other things, but not wages, um, I don't think fits within the spirit of what we generally expect from general contractors on the job. In addition, have, holding a contractor to have responsibility only if they have actual knowledge that their sub is not paying wages, um, I think defeats the purpose of this whole bill because then uh, we're, I mean, the idea is to hold a contractor responsible not only so that our workers have another avenue to pursue, but also to ensure that contractors are hiring reputable uh, subs and know who they're hiring and hire subs that they know will take care of their workers. So um, for, that, for those reasons, um, and probably for more that Adam can think of too, I would uh, urge that we do not support, that the, commission, the committee does not support this amendment. Thank you, um, and Senator Marty. Thank you. Madam Chair, um, I think Senator Seberger is right with that. I, 
the contractors are breaking the law and not paying wages they're supposed to be paying are they're not going to say hey contractor i'm i'm going to cheat they're not going to do it and as senator seberger said you know if the if the subcontractor is dishonest and disreputable it seems to me that that the contractor has to if they have no skin in the game in this they're not going to say we're going to we'll keep contracting with you because you give us good rates and everything else you you have to say no if the contractor doesn't have the obligation they have no no incentive to crack down on the dishonest con subcontractors i i think this does undercut the whole bill thank you senator senator grunhagen oh thank you yeah, thanks for the discussion. And the uh, I would say as far as the wages are done behind the scenes and not something that general contractors or owners are paying attention because it's the subcontractor's responsibility. And also, there's nothing preventing the person, if they thought wage theft happened, that they can't file a complaint with the Department of Labor or the Attorney General's office. And again, we have strong laws to address that. The other thing that... Um, uh, that I'd bring out as a little bit of a concern here uh, that this uh, amendment would address. You know, in the House, I served on judiciary and public safety for several sessions, okay? And one of the things I began to notice is that when there was an expansion of uh, civil action under a particular bill, uh, for whatever reason, <laughs> I won't give those, um, the net seems to be thrown as wide as possible to catch as many people into that civil action as possible so that whoever has the money or hasn't gone out of business can be caught in that civil action, whether or not they were actually uh, directly responsible for whatever happened in that situation. And I guess I, I see this bill take, going down the same type of a path, and it's probably something you can work on because obviously you don't sound like you want to accept this amendment, but you know, I, I'm all for, for prosecuting the perpetrator and pro properly funding this department and hiring additional investigators and making employees aware where they can file complaints. We all support that, okay? And as has been testified, I think, by both sides, it's one of the toughest laws in the nation. And Mr. Dunnick seemed to acknowledge with COVID that did seem to slow the process down of implementation and there's an additional $3 million of funding. And as long as it goes to investigators, uh, I think it'll be money well spent. But um, uh, so when I read the bill, the net gets thrown as wide as possible to catch as many people as possible into it, regardless of the person who's actually perpetrating it. And uh, that's the other concern I have about that. And I think this amendment uh, minimizes that some. So I would encourage members to uh, vote yes on this amendment. Okay, um, we have the A2 amendment. Um, all in favor of adopting the A2 amendment um, on to Senate file 1988, please say aye. aye. All opposed, say nay. Nay. The nays have it. The amendment is not adopted. Further discussion? Yes, Senator Grunhagen. Oh, yeah. I was on my edge wondering if something would happen, but <laughs> no. I'm just trying to open this up for discussion, too. That's part of these amendments, is to get you thinking about that and working with the stakeholders to see if we can't come up with a little better compromise. And again, I go back to we need to really give the bills we passed uh, a chance to be implemented by hiring proper investigators and uh, getting rid of as, as much wage theft as possible. The next amendment I want to offer is the A3. Well, we have that passed out. The A3, um, to your amendment, Senator Grunhagen. Um, okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, basically, what the A3 does, it tries to uh, eliminate the exemptions. In other words, uh, when I look at the bill, and I will start on page 6, line 17 through 21. Well, actually, I should start on, line, on page 3. I'm sorry, members. Uh, let's see what I'm... Oh, here we go. Yeah, line, uh, uh, page 3, line 16. 
It says, for the purpose of this section, a construction contract shall not include a home improvement contract for the performance of a home improvement between a home improvement contractor and the owner of an owner-occupied dwelling. A home construction contract for one or two family dwelling units, except where such contract or contracts result in the construction of more than 10 one to two family owner occupied dwellings. So if it's a good law, then I guess what my amendment does is that it should apply to everyone. Because I'm sure wage theft probably happens in some of these other areas possibly. And of course we had testimony, uh, what was it, one in five, and yet we're excluding those people. And uh, we're just saying it has to go Ten one to two family owner occupied. I can imagine a lot of nine one to two family owner occupied uh, construction projects will be done just to get out, get out of avoidance of this bill. And so that's one part of the amendment. The other part of the amendment is on page six. Um, it's uh, line 17 through 21. And basically what it says is, Nothing in this section shall be deemed to d diminish rights, privileges, or remedies of any employee under any collective bargaining agreement. The provisions of this section may be waived by a collecting bar bargaining agreement with a bona fide building and construction uh, trade labor organization. So what it seems to do here through this exemption, if the general contractor offers some type of uh, concession to a collecting bargaining agreement, he can have, they can have the portions of this waived. And it just doesn't seem right in terms of law should apply right across the board. So what my amendment does, it addresses those two areas. And uh, I would appreciate uh, your uh, perspective on why we shouldn't accept this amendment and have the, have the bill, if it becomes law, apply right across the board, Madam Chair. Senator Seberger. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Grunhagen, to take the second part first, um, as Mr. Dunnick testified during his testimony, when there's uh, a collective bargaining uh, agreement in place um, or prevailing wage, there are already mechanisms that exist to take care of wage theft issues. Um, so these exemptions are there because we don't need this law when it comes to those. Um, and with respect to the first exemption, um, a one-size-fits-all law does not address, it doesn't target where the problem is. And really what this law is trying to do is target where we're seeing the wage theft. We're not seeing it on union jobs. We're not seeing it on prevailing wage jobs. We're not seeing it in the jobs that are carved out of this bill. So it's, there's, what we're doing is we're trying to keep this as narrow as possible to address where the problem lies. And for those reasons, I would urge uh, members to vote no on this amendment. Senator Greenhagen, follow up. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. And thanks for that response, Senator Seberger. I do agree with your one comment. This bill is not necessary, okay? I do think we need the, the laws that have been passed properly funded with the proper investigation and notification of employees to work first, rather than pile another uh, uh, another law, well-meaning, I'm not saying you're not well-meaning, okay, but I don't think it's gonna do that much. It's gonna cause more problems than, than what it solves, in my opinion. And I would like to uh, have uh, Mr. Worky just comment on the amendment I'm offering, if he would. Uh, Mr. Worky, um, do you have any comment about Briefly, this Madam, Madam A3 Chair. amendment? Briefly, Senator Grunhagen. Um, I don't want to speak to the functionality of whether or not the amendment um, would, would have a discernible effect. I want to speak to the following because we remain confused as an association who collectively bargains with 15 different trades with, with, for, for collective bargaining agreements. As Mr. Dunnick stated, there is a grievance procedure within those collective bargaining agreements to manage claims and disputes that may arise under, uh, under this bill. But we need to understand something about commercial construction and about the, the signatory contracting world. Not every contractor who employs labor 
has signatory labor across the board. A contractor may be signed with one trade union, and the rest of their workforce is not signatory to a, a bargaining agreement. We do not understand how being signed to one collective bargaining agreement with one provision that would provide a pathway for resolution of these uh, disputes to collectively apply to the balance of that workforce. So therefore, if the intent of the bill is to prohibit theft of all workers, we would contest that you're only under the guise of this language in the bill, not in the amendment, in the bill, would only protect the workers under that collective bargaining agreement. I have yet to be informed as to how it would collectively apply across the entirety of a contractor's workforce. Thank you, Mr. Werke. It, and I feel it's only fair to offer a, a response, Senator Sieberger or Mr. Dunnick, if there is any response, please go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would invite Mr. Dunnick to respond. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just you know, also trying to be brief. Uh, in the exemptions, it, I, I will just kind of restate what Senator Sieberger said. The exemptions were written with the idea in mind that workers have recourse on a prevailing wage project or through a collective bargaining agreement. To the specific example that Mr. Workey brought up, even under that situation, if a contractor is signatory to one union, that in and of itself is much more of a clear picture than a worker on a multi-family project where there's five tiers of subcontractors that are only there to cheat the worker. That's the only reason you have a sub of a sub of a sub. There's no other reason. <laughs> that's, so the example that's raised here, um, it, we can work through those, those case by case examples. A, a CBA exemption, we believe is clear. If there's a way to tighten up that language and get it written better, we're certainly open to, to suggestions. Senator Grunhagen, follow up. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for that response, both of you testifiers. And I would just uh, say that I think I know how this amendment's going to turn out. Okay, but um, I I really believe this, regardless of how well intended the the bill is. Okay, and I know there's good intentions behind it. I think you're going to do more damage than good with this bill. I think we need to concentrate on the laws that have been passed, make sure they're properly funded, and check with the agencies and the Eternal Attorney General as to what needs to be done to get it enforced. Because the testimonies we had, I don't doubt that they, were, they had wage theft, okay? But they should have a process already in, in, in place with uh, the Attorney General or the agency to make their grievance. And I don't see this as taking us further down the path. I see this as taking us in a path that's going to create more damage than good. So I would seriously consider, I don't know if it can be remedied. I don't think it can. I would actually uh, pull the bill. So members, I would uh, urge a no vote, but uh, I know uh, that sometimes falls on deaf ears. So <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair. Yes. Okay, uh, that was going to be my question. Thank you, Senator Grunhagen. The A3 amendment has been withdrawn. Um, and, and members, are there any other uh, comments, any other discussion? Okay, very good. This has been an excellent discussion today. Um, I also echo the thanks that we've heard. Thank you to all of the testifiers today. Thank you, especially to people who took the time to come in the evening uh, after a full day's work to hear this bill and to put in the time to, to share um, your opinions and um, your experiences. It's really important for all of us to hear from you. So thank you for that very much. Um, it does strike me um, just that the what I heard through some of the testimony today is that this is a pattern. That's something that really struck with me, that um, this is is um, something that is is not an issue of the the few bad apples. This is something that is endemic to this industry, this work, and um, that it calls for a special remedy. Um, so, um, with that, and seeing no other further comments, um, Senator Pappas. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would move that Senate Bill 1988 be recommended to pass and sent to the Committee on Judiciary. Thank you, Senator Pappas. All in favor of Senator Pappas's motion say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. No. The motion passes. Thank you very much, Senator.
And thank you, testifiers. The uh, Senate Labor Committee is adjourned.